vote. Um, we do have Senator Harry Marsh, who is here with us this evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we also And 
then following Main Street all the way out to Rockets Lane in the East End. The BRT service will use dedicated lanes in various portions of the corridor, and so I'll walk you through that in, uh, in just a moment. But first, let's um, talk a little bit about what we mean by bus rapid transit. Um, bus rapid transit is a unique type of transit service, and it's really uh, a, a very appropriate type of transit technology for a city the size of Richmond. Uh, it provides high quality, high capacity, and rapid transit, um, but it creates those improvements through investments in, uh, in vehicles and buses that are um, relatively affordable, station improvements, uh, traffic signal operations, and some improvements to the roadway itself where the bus is running. So it's unlike some of the rail types of transit, it's not sort of a one size fits all uniform um, uh, system. It is really customized to the corridor in which it's located. Some of the examples of BRT improvements include low floor buses. So you would have what we call level boarding, just like a just like a light rail car would have. Uh, where you step straight from the station into the bus. We have sidewalk and crosswalk improvements to improve safety and accessing the buses. Um, the buses would have signal priority to help them I have a streamlined trip I was open that server we did the covers. Um, we have off-board fare collection. Yeah, and this would be something really good but to cover. much more affordable in, uh, in total uh, with bus rapid transit. But some of those amenities like off-board fare collection really help save time and give you that sense for urban transit. And of course, the dedicated lanes are very important of uh, the BRT approach. So, the way that we've developed our uh, recommended alternatives is really kind of looking at the corridor in four parts. Um, we have distinctly different uh, sort of traffic characteristics and land use uh, in these four different parts of the corridor. And so, again, because bus rapid transit is, is a flexible approach to rapid transit, we have customized our recommended alternative in each section of the corridor. So, um, so I'll walk you through that. But in, throughout the corridor, what you would have is um, in the peak periods, so that's the morning and evening rush hour, you have a bus every 10 minutes. And then between the peak periods, you have a bus every 15 minutes. You have new BRT vehicles. They all use compressed nat nat natural gas, CNG. Um, and then we've got 14 stations and a park and ride lot throughout the so let's start in the West End. In this part of the border, um, you don't have a lot of traffic congestion, uh, and you've got three lanes in each direction on Broad Street. So the way that we create bus rapid transit, the way that we improve the travel time for these buses, is, uh, is by having uh, just a, a fewer set of stops. So instead of stopping at every corner, you've really got a little long stop, got to stop at Staples Mill and then again at Hamilton. Um, and so that way the buses have a more streamlined trip through that part of the corridor. Um, they just be riding with traffic, but there could be some um, signal improvements in this section. The next section goes all the way from, up and on. Uh, from Thompson, uh, I'm sorry, from, uh, from Hamilton to uh, Thompson. So this section goes through the museum district and the area and here traffic levels are a little bit higher um, but there's still not a whole lot of congestion in fact if you drive through this part of the quarry you probably notice that people avoid the left lane um, so they don't get stuck behind somebody turning left well we would take that lane and that would be our dedicated lane for the buses um, uh, the way that we would improve speeds and performance in this section of the quarter um, includes uh, having that dedicated lane for the buses um, giving signal priority at the intersections, and that's not signal preemption like emergency vehicles have. It's a priority so that when the light is already green, it gives the bus to have a greater opportunity to get through um, the intersection by extending that green light if they need it. Um, that could be done now, with a bus. Left turning traffic could use the bus lane uh, in this section, so that's really a safety improvement. You wouldn't have people coming up behind other cars turning left. Um, and uh, the other impact that we have in this section is that we would need to remove parking on one side of the street. Uh, but here, the buses are going a lot faster because they've got their own lane and they're separated from the local buses altogether. 
he just in the general traffic and still use that left lane. Then that's not a great idea. Yeah, that's not a great idea. Yeah, it's still not a great idea. Basically, the buses go through the intersection and stop at the station. Those folks 
folks can now leave their cars at home, they would expect to save over $800 a year in vehicle operating expenses by using BRT. We also have improvements at station areas. Uh, we have benefits in terms of calming traffic through the use of dedicated bus lanes. So that all reduces traffic cost flows, and that can reduce the traffic, uh, I mean the crash rates in the border from anywhere from 8 to 31 percent. So that's a benefit for everyone, not only the buses, but the cars and the pedestrians in the border. The investment itself will create about 406 jobs in the region through design and construction. And the permit will increase uh, property values in the border. We've looked at other um, cities that have made this type of investment and a modest estimate of the impacts would be about a 12% increase in property values along the border, not counting the development in the So it kind so of changes the gentrification of certain areas. Um, the, the things that drive costs are uh, include, in, in terms of the capital costs, um, the drivers for costs are the number of buses that we needed in that peak period, how much was the total number of buses we have to put out, um, and then of course the physical improvements uh, to the port. In terms of the operating costs, some of the cost considerations, again, include the number of peak and off-peak drivers um, operating this in the service, uh, the fuel costs, and then also looking at whether uh, if a lot of the existing Route 6 riders can go over to BRT, um, uh, is there a, an ability to, to make the overall transit um, system more efficient as a result of that. So we have uh, an updated cost and project schedule presented in this slide, and um, this kind of lays out the costs that are coming up in the near term in order to um, so the, next, the very next phase of the project is preliminary engineering. So that's moving us into the design phase, we're deciding what this is going to look like. Um, that's a $4 million study that's already fully funded and will be starting soon. After we have our design, um, then we move into, the, after we have our preliminary design, we have the final design and construction, and that will cost just under $50 million. Uh, and I'll talk in a moment about where those funds might come from. And then the plan opening will be right around now the operating costs um, are, if you were just operating the BRT service, it would cost over $2 million a year, but um, we have looked at what the total system costs are without BRT and the total system costs with BRT, and the difference is only about $400,000. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. One is bringing um, more CNG buses into the fleet, uh, for example, which really brings those fuel costs down. Another reason is that a lot of the buses in the system will also see travel time savings, and that helps reduce their operating costs. So, um, so there are a lot of ways that implementing BRT um, makes the, the total system more efficient. And so the, the net operating cost for BRT is $400,000 mm -hmm. a year. Um, and if, uh, if this service is like the rest of the GRTC system, we would expect fares to grow about 20% of that, leaving $320,000 a year to be covered through
Um, but if that doesn't uh, get selected for some reason, uh, the, the Federal Trade Administration has a program called Small Starts that is uh, another option. We have been following their, their selection criteria very much in keeping with um, the, the way that they like to see transit projects be developed and presented, and we have every expectation that we would be able to get this funding in the time frame to come through. And then finally, the operating funding plan. Uh, this, is, this would be an annual expense um, to cover the net increase in uh, in staffing and you see that, right? and so on. And um, we would see 24% uh, of that coming from DRPT um, based on, this is an estimate, um, and then that would be 54% to come from the city of Richmond and 2% from the regular county. But as you can see, those aren't really big dollar amounts that we'd be asking for them to increase. Uh, these are not large increases over what they currently provide to GRTC for annual operating expenses. And as I noted, DRPT um, would, on the capital side, from 34%, and then on the operating side, 24%. These are estimates based on DRPT's current funding program. Um, and then the local costs, as we were just talking about with the pie charts there, um, you know, the, the amount that we need for capital is much lower because we have the opportunity to bring those federal dollars in. But then once it's up and running, we need to keep funding it every year um, through these operating subsidies. So what's next for BRT? Um, we're at the point now where we have a full-fledged recommended alternative. Um, our um, policy and technical advisory committees met at the beginning of the month and, uh, and are kind of putting their endorsement on our recommended alternative that we're presenting to you tonight. Um, we're having this, this meeting and tomorrow night's meeting to generate public input. We'll kind of gather all those comments on June 6th and then go to the GRTC board for approval June 17th. And then, um, and Amy mentioned, uh, we've been cooperating with our regional planning agency, the NPO. Um, they have to uh, have this project in their long range plan for it to be able to move forward. And so we go to them in the end of July or August. We'll continue to coordinate with the city and the county to solidify the funding commitments. And as we get into the design process, a lot of coordination will occur to make sure that that design is successful and approved by the city. Um, we'll continue to coordinate with BCU and then other key stakeholders throughout the quarter, um, as well as the public. Uh, some of the uh, important things that we'll be looking at in the future include the, the review of the proposed design and branding uh, that will ultimately be put on this system. So those are um, upcoming opportunities for involvement and outreach. Um, as I noted earlier, we expect the project to proceed through design over the next uh, uh, two, two and a half years, and then um, hopefully have an opening day in 2018. So that's our, our schedule that we have, that we anticipate as of today. And with that, we are ready for, um, for any questions you might have. Amy's going to take a look at that. Thank you, Laura. She does an amazing job covering a lot of material. Um, so thank you, Laura. So questions? Now's the time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Having any impacts in that, in that regard. 
um, in terms of the bus maintenance facility. The buses, they'll be, um, they will be branded buses, but they'll be the similar kinds of buses that we have that GRTC has today. So there, there won't be any additional type of maintenance requirement for these, these buses. Um, in Thanks, terms of the additional so element, the this is something that the city will have to, and, and the county, will have to incorporate into their um, ongoing operating assistance, as well as the Department of Rail and Public Transportation um, that goes to support uh, GRTC. And I'll look to, to David if that's accurate. I mean, I don't think there needs to be any more discussion than that. If, if, you, if that's not accurate, go ahead and say something. So. No, no, the, the funny that going in. Yeah, I think that that's, that will be part of their, their ongoing operating budget that they will request from the city. So they're, they're, um, they know that they're going to use the um, this incremental cost uh, will be basically required uh, as part of the implementation of the BRT service. The funding question would be more suited to somebody from the city of Richmond to answer. I'm not sure exactly how they acquire revenue to transfer to GRTC for O&M. Uh, in terms of the, the maintenance facility, it, it, is, it is plenty big enough in order to support uh, BRT vehicles. Uh, we have um, uh, an adequate number of bays in order to perform maintenance on it. When the, the facility was designed, the bays were built deep enough to actually accommodate articulated vehicles in the event that someday we needed such types of vehicles to run on the streets. Uh, the, 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 the facility is uh, compressed, natural gas compliant. We just opened a $5 million CNG fueling station on site in order to support fueling other vehicles. Uh, as we mentioned during the presentation, the BRT vehicles will be fueled by compressed natural gas, so that's not an issue uh, at all. Either. Lift equipment inside the maintenance bays again are sufficient enough to support the BRT. There are no capital improvements that are needed to facility. Yes, and I think we have a question right here. Yeah, I just want to hear more about the third part. Oh, here you go. Oh, oh. oh not yet. I'd love to hear more about how the BRT will help improve the overall system. I saw some fit from members of savings, but I'm curious as to whether this is a sign that helps make the rest of the service better or if this is a route on its own. And then my second question was about the projected ridership for the line and how that compares to other buses. Just doing like a rough calculation with my own calculator, so I, this is my like, caveat to everyone who's been totally wrong. It seems like you're saying your box is 8000 if you say $3 per round trip, divide that by 365, that's only 750 trip round trips a day. And I mean, I know that clearly there would be way more on Monday through Friday than on the weekends, but I, that seems very low to me. Sure. It is. Um, so in terms of the service and the efficiencies, um, the BRT will help um, essentially get through the core room, you know, because we'll have, we'll have travel time savings. And with this improvement, the other buses are also going to improve from the quality of the, of the dedicated lane, the curb lane, and also the, um, the stops. Okay, so the way they're, they're going to be staging and the way they'll be able to, to move throughout the corridor is going to improve the efficiency. There will also be efficiencies because the BRT will, will um, Will enhance. There will be rest, there will be savings and efficiencies from throughout the service because we're making this investment um, in BRT. So um, it, it's hard to say exactly. You know, it's this one particular thing that's going to help. And overall, the system will improve. Um, and as we go forward with the study, we're going to continue to look at how the system is going to feed into this line and how that will um, will impact the, the entire uh, service. Is that It does not. Um, once and we did not have the, any assumptions built in um, to our modeling uh, about the transfer facility because there wasn't one designated. Um, and right now the, the site is temporary. So um, if and when there's a permanent site, then GRTC as they move forward will certainly want to look at that and how that, that integrates and feeds into the BRT service. Those are good questions. The ridership, we're expecting 11,000 riders that will benefit 
um, and approximately 3,900, 3,300 3, 3, um, actual daily riders on the BRT itself. So that would be, it's, it's, it's typical for the, the system. So the 20% the is not just for the, the BRT. The 20% operating assistance is for the system. Is that, is that right? Is that? I was just gonna say, uh, GRTC, we're, we're developing more of like a cash flow model that'll do the math the way that you're describing it. But for this level of planning, we're just looking at kind of the little sum of what kind of um, uh, revenue capture that GRTC has as, as a whole system. And then, so that's kind of a conservative assumption yeah. um, to make sure that we're not underestimating um, the variable return. Thank you. Does that help answer? We have one back here and then here and then here. Yes, sir. My name is Montague Magruder. I served on the GRTC and Transit Study Task Force, which is a commission that was created by City Council in 2012 and concluded in 2013. So some of the questions I will be asking are in relation to some of the recommendations made. First question I have is, um, according to the presentation, the museum ECU section will be running in the middle of the street when um, the recommendation number nine from the GRTC and Transit Study Task Force would recommend that the bus lanes be extended all the way down Broad Street on the curb side, down all the way to the county line and extend the hours of operation there in effect. Would this be a better alternative instead of um, disrupting lanes in the middle of the street, which will require us to basically turning that to get to the, from one side of the street to the other, and would be more safer for those who would have to cross the street from the middle because of mobility impairments. Um, second question is, um, how many studies were actually done to show that there was any kind of interest in having service to Rockets Landing. So in my knowledge, there has never been any studies that have shown that anyone in the Rockets Landing area is actually interested in any kind of transit there in the first place. Um, now another question I have is, what would happen if the, uh, the Richmond Metropolitan Transit for Transportation Authority, which was just created by the State Assembly this year, were to um, take a were to actually go forward and actually take control of all public transit within the um, Richmond Metro, and um, and why and why is there a disproportionate amount of funding from uh, between the city and Michael County? Those are the questions I have basically at this point. Okay, thank you. Those are good questions. Um, in terms of uh, the museum district and where we're identifying, where we've identified the dedicated guideway in the in the median. Um, one of the reasons I'm to warn up, she has better operational um, input on this, but essentially that particular area, we want to be able to get through that corridor you know, fairly quickly, and having the dedicated guideway in the median was the most appropriate place to have it for, for operation um, perspective. Now, where we transition from Adams over to 4th Street, there will, be, there will be a transition. We were not going to take any parking in that particular area. Okay, so there will be some few jumping as we get into the design and um, uh, engineering of the service. There will be some some crossover to get to the dedicated lane. Okay. But but how exactly would that work if um unless the, unless other stuff, all the traffic is stopped from being able to cross for the buses to cross over, the buses are still going to have to fight traffic to get from one lane to from one side of the street to the other. And that's something. That it, there's some signal operations that we can, can use um, using Q jumps, which would actually allow the buses a green light to get over and ahead of the cars. Um, it's, it, it is a technique, it's a, it's a traffic um, operations technique that other cities in the country have used um, that just allows the bus to advance. Um, and in, in terms of your question about the mobility and, and people being able to access the median station, uh, that you are correct. We are going to have to have very safe crossings, and the signals are going to have to be timed to allow for that. So everything is going to have to be ADA compatible. And again, those are some some design elements that will be um, that will be looked at in this next phase um, of study that GRTC will be undertaking. Um, to follow up on that, has um, there been any um, any kind of sign that the traffic engineering department of the city would be willing to um, rework the, sy the synchronization? to make sure that the cube jumps and whatnot would actually work? That's going to have to be part of, yes, that's part of the engineering that's gonna, that, that will be necessary. 
Um, we have worked with the engineering department throughout this whole process. We've done traffic impact studies. Um, so, so we've actually placed the, um, the bus facilities in places that will have the lowest amount of impact. Um, not only on traffic, but also at the intersections. So that's why we did place the median where we did, and we transitioned over to the curb where we did, because that was from, a, from an overall transportation um, impact perspective was the best place to have it. Well, from what I understand of it, though, the, a lot of, it, it was mainly because of a lot of business pushback about people um, not being able to park their cars in front of the businesses, which I believe is an unwarranted argument, seeing that a lot of businesses along that section have their own parking in the first place. We did respond to that. We heard that parking is a premium in that particular area, and we agree with that. And that's why we are not recommending removal of any parking in that particular area. Uh, so we're taking the opportunity to move the bus from the median to the curb. Now, in terms of your second question um, regarding rockets, um, there have been studies that go back to 2000 um, and before 2000 that have looked at the Richmond region, um, and it has identified the Broad Street corridor as really being um, the best foot forward and and, and um, the area that would that would support uh, a rapid transit type of service. And knowing that um, that this is the region's best foot forward for federal funding, we wanted to make sure that we that we um, we had a corridor that had the land uses that have the, the um, residential, we have health care, we have education, we have employment, all within this, this seven and a half mile corridor. We're linking Rockets Landing, it's a mixed use development. Those are folks that, that will utilize um, that will utilize this service. Uh, and so all of the studies over the, the many years have pointed to this um, to this particular corridor and rockets and little lawn were the two the two target points for us to be able to um, to have the, the service um, be as their destinations on each end. But wouldn't it make sense to just go ahead and route it to Churchill instead of along 25th Street along Jefferson and Nine Mile and then run, uh, have it use Interstate 64 to run to the airport, which has been suggested to connect a lot of people uh, to the jobs and to actually spearhead a lot of the um, a lot of the route the regular recommended route changes that were made in the comprehensive operations analysis done by GRTC a few years back, which basically suggested that a lot of the routes be t removed from Broad Street. I mean, because you could take some of the local bus lines, have it feed into the BRT line. And then there would, you know, and there would, which would increase usage. Basically, you could turn the BRT into a main trunk line that hits basically all the marks, especially if you were to have it serve both train stations. Yes, sir. And, 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 and we're not. Um, that is what we're doing. And um, we did look, we did a special study that looked at Churchill and the accessibility. And there is, there, um, there is a recommendation to have a better um, east end circulation, which GRTC will advance in, in recommending as you noted in the conference operations analysis. Um, so we, we acknowledge that, um, and, and in terms of the airport, that would be a, a future type of, um, of recommendation, and that might be something that we would look at next. Um, in terms of the RMA implementation, um, there have been discussions, they are a regional entity, but GRTC is the project sponsor, and they are the ones that will implement uh, the BRT service in, in the Richmond area. Um, and in terms of the city and the, the county, um, it, it's really, um, and GRTC can probably speak to this a little more fluently, but um, currently how they, they, how they um, basically charge the city and the county, there's just a very, there's a lot, there's a very small piece uh, that goes actually in Henrico County. So they're, they're actually paying for their, their share of the service. Um, if it gets extended to, to um, short pump or if it gets extended out to the airport, at some point in the future, then the county would be expected to pay for those additional operating expenses. I think we had some more questions back here. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry.
can you tell me what is the difference between the way that you all doing it now and the, the way that it was um, before you all did the, the transfer station? Because to me, that's the same thing. It's the same time as it was before you all did the transfer station. So the existing um, travel time is four minutes? Into any. The, the existing travel time today is 30 minutes. That, that was before the end. That's now how the the transfer station. The last project you wanted. Yeah, okay. Before, when the buses ran straight from Troy Street, it was 15 minutes. So I don't see a difference in what you all do now. And my other question is, um, I see a cost of fifty-three point eight million um, in making something, doing a new um, project. But I rode the bus Friday and some of the bus for hour and a half the bus from the Amherst. So, what do you all want to fix? What we have?
there will be deficiencies. I'm not sure who was who was next. Um, we had a couple back here, but I don't want to shortchange anybody. Let's go ahead and go back. Where are you? Go ahead, Scott. Right. You're over here. Scott, so are you okay? All right. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it, like possibly extending the short pump. When I, but when I first saw this map, did it already extend out the short pump? Uh, why is it not? Why is this map? It did originally. The, the original COA recommendation, it did have it going out to, to rockets, but we wanted to make sure that we had a good a good system that would be competitive for federal funding. And the seven and a half mile segment is really was the best foot forward from existing land use and the ability and implement implementability. Um, this this really was so there isn't anything saying that we wouldn't the next phase wouldn't go out to, to short pond or those are things, items for additional study, for sure. But that's not part of the 2018. That's not going to be what's going to be constructed by 2018. It's not a short pump. No, sir. It's just from full on to rocket landing. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, I have the number six one in Friday, and um, the normal stop that I pick it up one is. Um, North Macquarie and Broad Street, and I actually take it all the way up to Staples Mills when I work for Amazon. So, um, my concern is I don't see my bus stop available on this particular route. And um, I understand the fares are the same, but my concern is the timing because even with the transit change, um, my buses are not coming like they normally do. So my concern is, is it really worth me getting on this or just getting on a regular bus if there's going to be a, not still a number six going up to the line versus this particular um, uh, new route that is on uh, the proposal for. But on top of that, um, it's just going to be one lane for the buses all the way down to the line. For the district for the buses, or is it going to be in the uh, track? It's two lanes. Okay. So um, there's actually, there'll actually be two travel lanes for the BRT. And you will actually have a stop, a Staples Mill station that will, that's actually right there at Anthem. Okay. And we've been working with Anthem, we'll be happy to have you know, we've been working with Anthem on potentially having a park ride um, in, in that particular location. In terms of the accessibility, you can still take the Route 6 and, and have your access. The benefit of the BRT is you're going to have 10 minute peak, which you have good service right now, but you'll have 15 minute off peak service. Okay, so you'll have better off peak service than what you have today. It doesn't so make much of a difference. As well, just you know, from the travel time perspective, because they'll be operating it's only three in minutes. the lane and not in mixed traffic. Yeah, but see, I still have to walk up. Or to get on the bus, like one of the stops that you have. Because mine, like I said, I'm getting on in North Guardian Bar, I would have to walk up to Heritage and Meadow, or go down to the Shaper, which is right. so quite a distance, especially if I'm trying to get to work on time. Right. And those are some local, local, I think, how we feed into that, that my GRTC might be able to look at, and that hopefully might work to your advantage as they go to, um, to look at their feeder their feeder system. I hope that answers your question.
what those by manifestations. But the design, as we get further into your TC cases and to the design engineering, there's going to be a lot of time to talk about that. BRTs are designed at various standards. They're very prevalent in South America. And, uh, systems that people might be familiar with in South America are constructed at a much higher level standard than people might see around the United States. You know, we have five top oh. BRT systems in the U.S., uh, the highest quality being in Cleveland. So as we talk about the BRT that we're thinking about in Richmond, we always talk about the system in Cleveland. Uh, Las Vegas is another one. Oregon, Pittsburgh, and Los Angeles, California is, is the fifth. So, um, again, people who may have seen BRTs or even written on BRTs in South America, that's not exactly what we're looking at doing here. Those come with a much higher price tag than BRTs in the United States are building. Yes, absolutely. Building on the heritage uh, question from the lady on the other side, heritage better. Just trying to understand the rationale of why it's not up the morning, given the fact that we have a natural uh, destination for programs and loans and other things that can seem to deal with the quality of life. It's not the heritage. As opposed to the morning.
the kind of tenant that they're getting in there is they're looking to be zero in one car households. And, um, and there is a real desire uh, for access via transit from that area. And of course, we're also looking at the, the anticipated future development level. Um, certainly the regional transit studies that preceded this one were looking at future anticipated levels of development, which is uh, anticipated to be much greater in that area. But probably more importantly, back to Amy's point, we looked closely at the question of uh, serving Church Hill. And basically, um, you really wouldn't see travel time savings by extending buses up Broad Street because th that is already operating uh, pretty efficiently. And the service you have today, of course, provides a lot of access in that community. If PRT, as you noted, um, has fewer stops, so what we, what, what, through the coordination that we had in looking at those questions about looking at travel time, looking at access, um, what uh, the kind of compromise that was agreed upon was that to have a spur from Churchill to Rockets Landing to, so that people who want to get on BRT for a longer trip, um, they would have that ability to do that through this first race. But most of the people using the bus Horrible today idea. are really primarily going downtown, and they, if we had BRT going to the So if they do that, walk all of the distance will be further, will the travel time be shorter? Yes, yes, we yeah. yeah, yeah, well we did a thorough analysis, because we had, we shared your concern. I mean, there was a population out there that we're targeting that we want to serve, and we want to make sure that we're doing it appropriately and effectively. So, um, when, when that came up from our second round of public meetings, I believe, um, we, we did a thorough analysis. So, we did the analysis that we started at the analysis. Yeah, I was part of the team working on that, and, and we looked at the, the cities, and then there are a lot of local routes, and most of the people looked specifically at the surveys of where people were getting on, where they were getting off from those routes that serve Churchill. Most of them were getting off downtown, and the, the way you would route this BRT service, the travel time savings would be, would be minimal. The other thing to add to all of that is by going that way down Broad Street and up Churchill, and terminating somewhere on Churchill, be it up 25th or Chimborazo or wherever, um, you miss Main Street corridor. And there, while there are a lot of people in Churchill, the density is much higher in Shaka Bottom uh, in the Main Street corridor. So you have a much higher potential long-term of developing very high ridership levels. Um, and long-term rocket landing as well. So the combination of those two things um, led us to keep the termination down so, uh, I, so I have a few questions. Um, did you guys mention the can you like the time that it would take to get to roll on from Rocket Lane as it is now and then how much shorter it would be with BRT? It's 30 minutes today. Okay, and then 30 minutes today is 14 minutes. 30 minutes. 14 minutes say it's yeah. 35 minutes today, 21 minutes with BRT from downtown to with, so, with the BRT. With the BRT, it would be 21 minutes. Today it's 35 minutes. So it's a 14 minute savings. Okay. Um, second, uh, have you guys, I don't know, you know, this is the first meeting I've been to right now, but have you guys found going out to Churchill to conduct any like community engagement meetings with that neighborhood specifically? And if so, when do you? We have, we've been out working with the public, and as I mentioned, we, we worked with um, the Churchill and the East End neighborhoods um, about pretty, very extensively about a year ago. Um, and obviously, as this thing advances, there'll be additional opportunity for public outreach and community engagement. Um, but we've, we've done a fairly extensive level of outreach um, with the, the neighborhoods thus far. And, um, and the last question. Uh, I guess the bus transfer stations. Uh, I think you touched on it, but how, how does this incorporate that in the larger scheme? Yeah. You can kind of elaborate. It doesn't, because we didn't have a, a solid spot of where the transfer center was going to go when we began the study back in 2009. And, and quite frankly, they have independent utility. It isn't that when GRTC finds their permanent location that they'll want to integrate um, the service into the spine, into the BRT. But we didn't make any assumptions about um, the transfer center in, in the study that we're doing today. Well, uh, I guess it depends on, I mean, if it's, if it 
it's located in block over here to try to accommodate the, the transportation or Oh, of course. I mean, it's, it, it would be central. When, the, when GRTC finally has a location, they're going to do the analysis to make sure that their, their route circulation and their service is feeding in appropriately to, to the BRG. But that hasn't happened yet, so. And I guess when that happens, you'll see the community engagement stuff. They will absolutely. They have sought a lot of community engagement through that, through that process and they'll continue. And we have Virginia and then. Okay. And then we'll come up here for two minutes, sorry. I'm just curious. What is Robbins Landing? I mean, why was it chosen? <coughs> it's, it's right um, out of East Main Street. It is a um, very dense, mixed-use type of development. There's a lot of residential. There's retail uh, in that particular um, development. Mm -hmm. And it's expected to continue mm -hmm. to develop that. Montague Magruder. So that type of development is really attractive for a transit type of service Gee. because those are those are um, uh, riders that are R -U -D -E -R. really wanting to utilize yeah, the transportation services versus having a, a car. Well, you see, the reason why I'm not interested in that is because yeah, they're on um, GRTC and transit study task force. And I think the best is where I go. And I just um, I work at a nursing home um, in Hawaii. Obviously, people that are disabled and 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 people Jobs, yes, we'll some better. more job centers, more well, um, I will tell you that when we in, improve the service, it does benefit everyone. And I, and I see, I understand what you're saying. It, it can feel that way, but, um, yeah. but certainly the, serve more people to serve the more people to be more and to be more and to be more hope. And we're hoping that, you know, by serving we'll the train stations and the airport. I've got one other question. Um, eventually, after 2019,
more church here? Uh-huh. Okay. But what about the Fulton area? The Fulton Bible, maybe is that going to have a circulator or something that will feed into the bus uh, rapid transit? Yes, that's, that is part of our analysis. Yes, that whole full area. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that will have a circulator. And we can take a couple more questions from the weekend. Mm -hmm. I will take questions as long as people have, have them. Oh, so suggest I get on a theater line. I get on the bus rapid transit then, the next bus. I go a long ways and then I get on to the third bus feeding somewhere else in the metropolitan area. How many times am I going to pay for my transit? Is it going to be a unified system, or will I be paying in different ways at different times? Um, those are some fair um, collection um, policy questions, but right now we're expecting the fare to be the same. So you would have the, the, um, the same base fare and the third and transfer fares. That's something that the GRTC will look at as they advance the service, but right now we're expecting the, the fares and the transfers Exactly as they are today. Well, will a lot of these continued development um, parts of the process be available um, in, in a very public way as we continue this process? We expect it. Yes. Our federal, our state and federal funding will be paying for the next steps of this, and we will absolutely be having public involvement. Thank you. 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 Thank you know, I think I've had some of Ben Campbell's Kool-Aid with our PA credit. <laughs> um, but how are you, so what are targeted ways that we can advocate for now? Is it getting on the long-range transportation plan projects there or other studies that can lead to that turnover time being much less the second time around? It's, it's working with Ben and the outreach um, and really educating and, and letting the
plays into a lot of the questions that I've been hearing tonight that I haven't really had a chance to respond to. But you know, our priority over the next year or two is going to be figuring all this out. You know, we, we've heard the term feeder routes, we've heard the term circulators. We don't know all those answers yet. Those are the things that we need to figure out as we move through this preliminary engineering and design phase. And uh, one of our priorities is figuring out how the current bus system integrates with the BRT trunk and corridor. So over the next year and two, we're going to be going through these questions and we'll be getting out with the communities. Yes, somebody asked about are we going to meet with uh, the Churchill uh, neighborhoods. Yes, that's part of what GRTC is going to be doing over the next year. We do want to get out into the communities. We do want to get your input uh, before we put anything in place. But at the same time, we need to take a look at the overall system uh, uh, in connection with the amount of money that we have to operate. We can come up with the best ideas in the world in, in terms of how to get people to BRT. But if we don't have the funding in order to put things like that in place, then they're nothing other than great ideas. So we've got to work with the communities. We've got to work with the localities and the elected officials and figure out all the funding components. Those are all unanswered questions. But it's, there are things that we're going to be discussing over the next year or two. Well, can you send us things from the email list? Absolutely, and I think uh, just based on your comment, I think we need to probably put something in place on our end to solicit feedback and then to push information and turn it out to you all who are interested in receiving it. So, um, absolutely. And if you, if you put your email phone down, you can contact me after this. So, please, if you didn't put that down, sign it again. Yes. Okay, well. I think that serves as our last bit of comment. So thank you all. We'll be in, um, we'll be at the boards if anybody has any questions. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you coming.